Marry. Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will give birth to a son. And you shall call him Jesus.
Christmas to you. Yes. No, you're good. You're good. Yes. So if you didn't catch that, I, I'm, I shouldn't have cut you off, Josh, I'm sorry. Uh, but yes, uh, what you just saw here was a product of, of Jess Marie's leadership and, uh, and bringing that all together. And, uh, and I just want to tell you that, uh, phenomenal, phenomenal. Like, I don't know about you, but I was crying. <laughs> like, yeah, okay, all right. I thought maybe it was just me. I was really uncomfortable. Um, but, but I also want to say, you know, that's just, a, that's just a preview of things to come, am I right? Uh, and Jess Marie has a huge heart for human video and all things fine arts. And, uh, you know, we as a church, we've, we've put our toe in the water a little bit over the years in this. But with Jess Marie and, of course, with Pastor Noel here, uh, I expect more and more of this. Uh, and we already know that on Easter Sunday, uh, there's going to be another one of these. And so, uh, so this is just an awesome expression of ministry. And, uh, and so I just want to invite you one more time to thank Jess Marie for all that she invested in that. Thank you so much. It was excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so good. This is one of those Sundays where I'm like, I can't top any of that. That was so good from beginning to end. Uh, so uh, today I'm, I'm a little under the weather. Uh, in fact, all week long I've been struggling with a cold. I'm COVID negative, um, but, but I have struggled with this cold, and I know many of you have been struggling with a similar thing uh, over the last couple of weeks. And so, uh, But man, I feel like this message today, I, I really had to preach it, uh, and so I wanted to be here with you, plus all of the special things. Can we thank JD and the worship team? They did an excellent job. 
those Christmas carols are not easy. <laughs> They're not easy instrumentally or vocally, and, and they did it with excellence and led us well today. And I love the choir. Uh, I loved that aspect of it. J.D., great job. Thank you for your leadership there. Um, so I'm going to keep my comments brief, but uh, I'm sure none of you really mind that because lunch is calling. But uh, today, today I want to wrap up in earnest this series we've called Light of the World. And... Um, uh, pray for me that I'll make it through this, but uh, light of the world, and we've been kind of focused on this verse that we find in John chapter 8 and verse 12. It says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And that's what we've been pursuing these last few weeks, just this idea that Jesus brings to us this light of life. This life that is full, this life that is abundant, and when we experience the fullness of God's light in our life, our life is never the same. And so today, today I want to consider some final thoughts with you about this idea, the light of the world. And I want to approach it from a different direction uh, than we've done any of these weeks. Some of it has some overlap, but much of it is new. Uh, as, we explain, as we explore the biblical narrative leading up to all of this beauty that we've sung about and that we've seen portrayed, as we examine that biblical narrative leading up to that moment around the birth of Jesus, we see one very clear type of darkness that I just want to speak about today in our time that we have left. And that darkness that I want to consider with you today is the darkness of waiting. The darkness of waiting. You see, at the moment of Jesus' birth, we see the Jewish people in the middle of a waiting period. In fact, at the moment of the birth of Jesus, they had been waiting around 400 years. 400 years. We see nothing recorded in Scripture for 400 years. All we know is that the Jewish people are anticipating and waiting for a Messiah, waiting for their Savior to come. For 400 years, they waited in silence. They waited patiently. They waited in, I'm sure, some turmoil, 400 years, and God was silent the entire time. And then the waiting is over. We pick up the story in Luke chapter 2. You know it well, but I'll read it along with you. In those days, Caesar Augustus, he issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Everyone went to their own town to register, and so Joseph Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. So many implications there, we won't get into that today. He went there uh, to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes. She laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Sorry, I switched back to a different translation. It's the one I have memorized. And all in one moment, and all in one beautiful moment, we could easily jump to the conclusion that the waiting is over. The waiting is over. And when our waiting periods are over, isn't that a beautiful thing? I mean, there are kids in the room today that I'm sure you are waiting for Saturday. And when Saturday comes, the waiting will be over because it's Christmas Day. Joel said, yay. <laughs> All in one moment, the waiting is over. The darkness is over. The light has dawned. Or has it? Is the waiting truly over. It's interesting to me that the Jewish people waited 400 years, and then Mary was visited by an angel, and guess what? She had to wait another nine months. The waiting wasn't over when the child came, because guess what happens next? They then have to wait another 30 years for Jesus to start his public ministry. You see, the story of the Jewish people, the story of Christians, the story of Jesus, your story and my story is a story of waiting. Waiting upon waiting upon waiting, but what is true is the darkness of waiting can be daunting. 
When we have to wait in life, we do not like it. Waiting in life is uncomfortable, and oftentimes we do not wait well. And waiting is the worst. Come on, somebody. Do I have a witness in the house today? I hate to wait. I hate it. I'm very impatient. I am horrible at waiting. What is true is that all of us have seasons, have moments of waiting. And it can seem dark. It can seem like God is silent. But here's what I want you to think about today. Often, often how we deal with darkness is as important as how we live in the light. Often how we deal with darkness, how we deal with the waiting, how we live in the waiting, how we live through the waiting is as important as how we live in the light. Get this, while the Israelites were looking for a savior, God was looking for the faithful. While the Israelites were looking for a savior, God was looking down and in, in looking for faithfulness. It's why he picked Mary. Mary was faithful. Mary was obedient. In the waiting, Mary did not try to go somewhere else, be someone else. Instead, she leaned into the waiting and she remained faithful to what was true. And when you and I find ourselves in a dark place, when we are in the waiting, we are often looking for a Savior, aren't we? When we find ourselves in those waiting seasons, all we want is somebody to come and save us, somebody to come and rescue us, get us out of here. I've got to find a way out. But can I just tell you this morning before I lose my voice that God is not going to come as your Savior until you be, be found to be faithful. Be found to be faithful. Be faithful, church. Be faithful in the waiting. Know that the waiting is not always a negative thing. It is not always a bad thing. In the waiting is actually a time where you can become deeper and grow deeper in your faith of God. So my question simply to you this morning is, how are you waiting? How are you waiting? What is it that you do while you're in those waiting seasons? Maybe you're waiting for the scan to see if that cancer has shrunk. Or you're waiting for the promotion that you deeply are desiring at work. Or you're waiting on him or you're waiting on her to finally apologize or to finally forgive you. Perhaps you're waiting to get pregnant or waiting on retirement. How you're waiting right now in that dark season of your life, in the silence, is probably just as important as how you live when everything's going your way. When everything is going well, it is equally important that you live well in the waiting. And I'm going to say this boldly. Most of us, we are simply not good at waiting. In church, sometimes the most holy thing that we can do is just wait. Is just be is just remain silent and still. In Pentecostalism, we don't do that well, do we? We love the emotional, fired up, run around the sanctuary. But can I tell you, church, as holy as that can be, waiting can be holy too. Silence can be holy too. Some of us need to silence ourselves so we can move closer to the Almighty God. Sometimes the most holy thing that you and I can do is just wait. Reflect on these words found in Luke chapter 1. Because of the tender mercy, the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those of us living in darkness and in that shadow of death to guide our feet in a path of peace. You see, church, what is true is that in the waiting, God's tender, tender mercy is available to us. It's not once we get through the waiting that we can find God's tender mercy. It's in the middle of our mess-ups and our hang-ups that we can find the beauty of God's tender mercy. God's tender mercy does not wait on us to have it all together or all figured out. God's tender mercy is completely available to you and me no matter what part of waiting we find ourselves in today. His light will dawn. His light will guide us into peace, but lean into that mercy during the waiting and during the darkness. And the question is not what are you waiting for, but how are you waiting? It's not at all what you're waiting for, because I guarantee that what you're waiting for, it is important. What you're waiting for right now and today, what you're waiting for, some of us are waiting for a daughter to get back from Alaska, aren't we? 
We are hoping. We are praying. We cannot wait for that plane to touch down. Pray for her. She's had some struggles getting back. But in that waiting, it's not what we're waiting for. Of course, a daughter is important. Of course, a daughter's visit on Christmas is valuable. But can I just tell you, church, it's not about what we're waiting for. It's about how we're waiting. Are we angry in the waiting? Are we doubting God in the waiting? How are you and I waiting? It is such an important question because waiting can be hard. And the way that we wait is so important because, listen to me, this is a hard truth to swallow. God's timeline on darkness is often not our timeline. God's timeline on darkness is not at all our timeline. Let's go back and ask the Jewish people, 400 years? Okay, God, I can take 50 years. I can take one generation. 400 years. Okay, Jesus is born. Jesus, man, you're 20. Can I just talk to the 20-somethings in the room for just a minute? How many know Jesus was probably biting at the, uh, biting at, chomping at the bit? Is that the same? Chomping at the bit to get out there and start his public ministry. Listen to me, 20, 30-somethings. Your time will come. Your time will come. Wait for your time and your time will come. I guarantee that God sees you. He knows what you are waiting for. Just be patient in the waiting. Be faithful in the waiting. He has something special for you in the waiting. Can I just talk to my 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 somethings? Listen to me. Your time will come. Your time is not over. God is faithful. Be faithful in the waiting. That's where a good amen goes, church. God's timeline on darkness is often not our timeline. Do not get caught up on the timeline. Man, that is not good news at all, is it? But I found it over and over again in my life, and I hate it every time. I think I know the answer. I think I know the direction. I think I see what God is doing, but it never seems to come as quickly as I want it to. His timeline is not my timeline at all. This is why we're horrible at discipleship. It's why we're horrible at relationships. It's why we're horrible at conflict management. Because we just want to get to the end result. We just want that person to change. We just want that relationship to be solid. We just want that conflict to be over church. God's timeline is often not our timeline. We have to be patient in the process. People do not change overnight. Relationships are not solid in a week, and conflict is not well resolved in a moment. It's why so few of us are engaged in any real mentoring or discipleship. We want that other person to change. We want them to change now. And we find ourselves frustrated when people keep going back to old ways and old habits. And you know this, we're an instant gratification culture, aren't we? Instant gratification. I say it this way, I want what I want, and I want it now. That is an American thing. It is not a Christian thing. God's way is the way of waiting. It is the way of peace. It is the way of gaps. Because listen to me, church, when you've had to wait for something, you will appreciate it more. I sound like I'm talking to my children. In fact, my family and I were going to Disney next year. I didn't expect anything, anybody other than my family to be excited. We've never been. It's, it's going to be our first time going. We're going, I think I've mentioned before, but we're going with Consuela's parents, Consuela's aunt, and Consuela's sister and her four kids. And it's going to be a fabulous trip for all of us to Disney. We're looking forward to going next year. And uh, you know what I want, though? I want the Fast Pass. I want that Fast Pass. Why? Because I don't want to wait. I want to get on things quickly. I want to be at the end. I want to get there. I want to do it. I want to move. I don't want to stand in line. I don't like waiting. Even if I know it's a really good thing. Come on, am I preaching to anybody today? Even if I know it's a really good thing, I don't want to have to wait for it. God, can you just give me the fast pass of life? And he'll say, yeah, I'll take you up to heaven right now. Come on. Come on. That fast pass is right to heaven. I didn't have that in my notes. I should write that one down. Maybe you had this experience of waiting. The waiting rooms of life are tough. And I uh, had to take my three, uh, three of my four kids to get a sports physical at the doctor. And so we walked into the doctor's office and we, we checked in and I signed all of that paperwork that felt like I was getting a second mortgage on my home. Uh, and then we sat down and we waited. Have you been in the doctor's waiting room lately? Especially now, it can be a long wait, can't it? 
So we did all of that, and as we're sitting there, we're the only people in the waiting room, another family walks in. And his other family, they come in, and they check in, and they sign all of the paperwork, and then they sat down and waited. And then the nurse comes out of the back, and she, she steps out, and she announces the name Smith. And this other family got up and went in, and I was like, we were here first! We were here first! How did they get to go back before us? You all know you do it, too. You're probably going to do it today when you go out to a restaurant. No, our name was in before theirs. What's going on? We don't like to wait. We are horrible at waiting. I don't like it. But I do that with other people. I do that in other situations. Maybe you do too. When I see others getting ahead in life, I begin to wonder, where's my get ahead? I see other people healed supernaturally, miraculously. And I wonder, God, where's, where's my healing? I see other people that are happy and content and successful and accomplished and recognized and connected. And I say to myself, I want all of that. And I want it now. Here's the words of St. John about Jesus. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. His light, it shines into the darkness, and the darkness will never overcome it. Even when I'm impatient, his light still shines into my darkness. Even when others seem to be getting ahead much quicker and much better than me, his light is still shining bright in my life. Sometimes if I'm not careful, I can extinguish the light of Jesus because of my own demands. And it is a slippery slope. Church, I'm going to be concluding here in just a minute, but let me just say this. You may be in darkness. You may find yourself in one of those waiting seasons, but can I just tell you, it will not overcome you. The darkness, the waiting that you're in right now, it will not win. Darkness does not have the last word. The light does. The light does. And church, that's the best news that any of us could hear today. That's the best news that any of us could reflect on this Christmas week. Darkness. Darkness does not have the last word. The light does. And that, my friends, is what Christmas is all about. After the waiting, after the darkness, after the torment, the pain, the suffering, our Savior is born. And He is the Prince of Peace. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. And 400 years of waiting is finally over. Nine months of waiting is finally over. 30 years of waiting is finally over. Church, 2,000 years later, the waiting is finally over because the darkness does not have the last word. The light does. And whatever you're waiting on today, I just implore you, wait well. Find yourself as a person who waits well. Be faithful in your waiting. Don't lean away from God in those times of waiting, but lean into God. Find ways to grow deeper in your trust of him, even if he appears to be silent. Trust God in his timing. Trust God in his process for you. Don't try to circumvent God's plan and God's will for your life. Be patient. Be humble in your waiting room. God's got this. And you know, whatever it is that you're trying to heal from, that thing does not have the last word. Whatever parts of you that are damaged or empty, they do not have the last word. Whatever areas of your life seem dark, uncertain, or confusing, those things do not have the last word, do not have the final say in your life. The light of the world has the final word, and his final word is victory for you. If not in this life, the next life for sure. Now, I love the Christmas carol that we've been singing a couple of times today. Oh, holy night. Again, the teens did a fabulous job of doing that. J.D. and the team did a great job of singing it. And I just want to tell you that, Oh, Holy Night, that carol actually started as a French poem. And so I want to teach you some French today. Would that be okay? 
So I want you to repeat after me. Say, Minwi. Min-wi. One more time. Minwi. Min-wi. Good. Kratian. Minwi Kratian. You guys are fluent French speakers. Look at that. <laughs> Minwi Kratian. Je parle français. Hey. What did you say? Somebody said, oh, no. I said, je, je parle. That means I speak. <laughs> Uh, so, Minui Chrétien means Midnight Christian. Minui Chrétien. It's the poem. It's the original poem that O Holy Night was adapted from. And basically, this poem tells all of us Christians that midnight, oh, get this, church, that midnight is the most holy hour. And I don't know about you. But my midnights, I just want to move past them. I just want to get on with life. I just want to turn on the lamp. I just want to turn on some light. I just want the sun to come up. My midnights do not feel like the most holy times in my life. But as this song teaches us and that poet taught us, midnight just might be the most holy hour of your life. Why? Because it's always darkest before the dawn. And in those seasons of waiting, in those moments of a midnight, they can be a time worth embracing for us. When others run from that darkness, this poem and this carol reminds us, embrace the darkness. Embrace the waiting. Because there's something very special to be found there. The words go like this, O holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining until he appeared and the soul felt his worth. And all in that midnight moment, there was this thrill of hope. This moment where the hope was not only tangible, it was accessible. This thrill like you're getting to the top of a peak of a roller coaster and you can feel the butterflies in your stomach, but man, you're anticipating what's getting ready to come. The high of going down that hill, it is the thrill of hope. In church, if there's ever a time where I would say the church is weary, it is today. It is the last 24 months of our lives. We are a weary people. But the beauty of our Savior, the beauty of finding hope in the waiting, the beauty of persevering through all of that is that we can rejoice. The weary world rejoices. And that joy that is easily accessible to each of us is not just for us. It is for the world that thrill of hope and the fact that we can rejoice even when we're weary because the yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. And so what's our response? To fall on our knees. Hear the angel voices because it is a divine night where the divinity of God shows up in the person of Jesus. O night when Christ was born. What beautiful words for all of us this Christmas. And so my challenge to all of us as we enter this week of Christmas, my prayer for you is that this week is a holy week for you. That you would take time, that all of us would take time and reflect on that holiness that is brought from the darkest places. And that we all look beyond the waiting to a Savior who came to give us the light of life. Worship team, come on back up. Let's worship him together, everybody. Stand to your feet.
Silent night, holy night, all is calm and all is bright around yon virgin mother and child. rest in you for a few moments, Lord, in this busy season. Father, I pray that each of us, as we leave here, would take this peace with us, Father God, and that we would embrace the weariness and just the thrill of hope, Father God. We thank you for all that you've done, and we just worship you as our King in Jesus' name.
Just one quick announcement before we do the blessing. We will have our food pantry tomorrow. We have a few special things planned for Christmas. So if you would like to serve, we'll be unloading tomorrow between 9.30 and 11. And then we'll serve our guests from 5 to 7. If you want to arrive around 4.30, that would be amazing. And here's the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May you all have a peaceful week and we hope to see you here on Christmas Eve.